AI relevant to your business. So a lot of information you know, being thrown at you in the media, uh, maybe even by vendors, maybe even by my company occasionally. Um, that's kind of hard to decipher how you actually make AI relevant to your business. If you're here today to learn about neural networks of all different types or TensorFlow or Path A or anything, I'm sorry you're going to be disappointed because we are intentionally not going down to how you actually do that at that level because, um, and we'll talk about why, uh, primarily because that's not really uh, at a level that businesses, um, the average organization, is going to implement AI. Now, of course, you're going to have Netflix or, or some, some other company like Google implement AI, you know, and they're going to go soup to nuts, and they're going to use uh, some of these other um, AI frameworks to do that. And we have uh, uh, quite a few offerings that are based on TensorFlow, CAFE, and so on and so forth. Uh, but that's not really the kind of AI that we're going to talk about today because we want to make it relevant to the business. So Michael, you want to talk about the agenda? Certainly. So as Andros mentioned, today's discussion is going to be focused on um, giving you enough insight and context around AI so that when you come across a business problem or have one of your favorite C-level clients say, tell me about AI, I want to do AI, you'll have tools and insight that allow you to have an effective conversation, that allow you to work with them to build a prototype, a POC that will be successful, and that will allow you to use architecture the entire time that you do it. So we're going to go from the basics of AI, try to establish some real-world definitions, We'll share insight around, you know, how do you get started with AI in business if you've never done either. Then we'll talk about some of the best practices that we've come up with based on repeated customer experiences. We'll then take a minute to showcase some actual new AI applications that we've built over the past few months, showcasing AI being applied to the business of the open group, such as TOGAF and the open, uh, and the open career framework. And finally, We'll, we'll, uh, we'll take a minute to share some, of, some, great, uh, some great lessons learned at great cost, insights gained from some of our most complex but still successful implementations. Yep. So Michael and I, especially Michael, has been uh, working with our customers to implement AI-based applications and has been through the trenches and the war uh, with what that means. So let's talk about the uh, basics, and we'll start from the beginning with an introduction to AI. Um, first off, uh, AI is not machine learning. Machine learning is really all of the algorithms that are used that, um, as a broad landscape and framework um, to implement artificial intelligence. Uh, this is a great history. Um, I love to show this because actually Carrie and I went to college, uh, graduate school at the same time, and um, he mentioned that the fact that uh, he had a, a concentration in AI, and I did too, and both of us were kind of talking about the fact that we went to school, got our degrees, and came out and, you know, crickets with respect to AI afterwards, right? No, no talk about it up until the last, you know, five, six, seven years, uh, maybe even when Watson won Jeopardy. Um, so uh, it, it's, this is a great chart that shows kind of the beginning with, with Turing talking about uh, the Turing test uh, and um, uh, completeness and, and, and NP complete uh, processes um, and the creation of the original Minsky neural net, which is actually still quite valid today. Um, and then this, uh, this group of folks thought, well, in 56, uh, we're just going to go off and um, work for a few weeks. In fact, they allocated themselves uh, two weeks, this darkness group, to come up with a, uh, an artificial intelligence framework. I thought that was kind of um, interesting that they uh, gave themselves only two weeks to mimic uh, human intelligence. But So they found it was a little bit more difficult. Um, you started to see uh, algorithms play checkers. 
then you came across semantic networks you had the first chat bot and we'll talk a lot about assistance or chat bots here because we actually implemented one for the open group as part of our demonstration in Eliza and then you we went into this AI winter where not much happened then you came out of it you started hearing a lot about expert systems predictability that was really more about analytics quite frankly prescriptive analytics than it was AI in my mind and and then the second winter occurred up until the point where you and I went to school and even then afterwards not a whole lot but then IBM used learning algorithms machine learning algorithms to beat Kasparov with deep blue a lot of interest and you know vitality went back into artificial intelligence there then in you know still from from where I was standing after that there was a lull in in interest in in AI and then the DARPA grand challenge in around the year 2000 actually we started working on Watson and thought about what the grand challenge might be and they were sitting in a bar and Jeopardy was on TV and the scientists from IBM research said well why don't we build an artificial intelligence a system that can win at Jeopardy because that is a very complex game I'll give you an example you know one of the winning categories was British television and the question or rather the answer if you know what Jeopardy is you know you're given categories and then answers and you're supposed to figure out what the question is and answer in the form of the question the answer was you know this this time machine appeared on BBC television one one day after Kennedy's assassination anybody know the answer to that a TARDIS absolutely right Doctor Who you you gotta be a Whovian right I love Doctor Who I like the new series too so so anyway you had to build a machine that understood the semantics of what it meant to answer in the form of a question you had to build a machine that understood natural language processing and the contents context and the sentiment in order to actually win that game and it took them you know quite a few years between the time they were at the bar and they said hey let's build a system that actually does this to the time when they actually went on television and and won against two of the top world players and by their way there were a lot of simulated they built a whole Jeopardy simulation in IBM and had many opportunities to play the game against just average researchers you know you could sign up to play the game and part of artificial intelligence and machine learning is actually getting that data getting the reference data that allows you to actually train your models and learn over a period of time well then you know fast forward here just a not so long ago Google starts playing go which is one of the you know most complicated board games which has billions of different permutations and really to IBM ers we were like you know that's not all that interesting why because it was an extension of what we did with the the game that played chess and beat Kasparov deep blue the only thing that they did was really interesting was they they really came up with back propagation and kind of these deep learning networks that learn from learning so then they they turn the machine around after it learned the basics skills of go and they had it play itself or play another version of it until it actually learned all sorts of new patterns that nobody had figured out before so that was the innovation there and then alpha zero which was again remind me what was the difference between go alpha go and alpha zero well I think a lot of that is representative of the different iterations of the learning pattern used I mean in this case the system as you mentioned would play against itself and 
they'd have a modern version of it, say version 9, playing against version 8 or 7. And this, as Andros mentioned, is a very interesting and cool thing. Uh, as we'll talk about, many of the systems that exist today, you have to sort of hand feed it or create your own way to feed it and update it. So this idea of having a system that could simply learn from itself without human intervention is still one that's noteworthy, and I imagine we'll see more of it in the future. I, I suppose we will. I think that's actually the really cool part about uh, artificial intelligence. So machine learning is really about the algorithms and the frameworks. AI is about trying to mimic human intelligence. And from IBM's point of view, it's more about the human in the loop or the aiding the human versus replacing the human. For a lot of different reasons, we don't believe that the singularity, you hear this idea that the singularity is coming, that it's uh, an autonomous, sentient personality. We don't believe that's going to happen anytime soon uh, for a lot of different reasons. But uh, this particular uh, AI timeline is really about the taking all these machine learning algorithms and so on and so forth and then turning it into a fit for pur purpose solution. Um, you know, that's, that started with Deep Blue, you see Kismet up there. You know, I have a Roomba. My wife gives me a lot of crap about Roomba because it, it really is uh, pathetic. Um, you know, uh, I liked it, it was fun, but my wife just like, how come your robot isn't cleaning over there, you know? Um, Siri, uh, Siri is, uh, you know, the, the chat, the front end of the chat bot really is what Siri is. And uh, back end uh, learning algorithms. And you had Watson, you got the Eugene, the use of Alexa, which by the way, um, is a series of frameworks. Some of them are AI, some of them are not. Uh, this uh, recently, I think Kay was in the news, right? She's making Southeast Asia a tour right now. Oh, you may be thinking of Sophia, the robot. Sophia, okay, this, so they look the same to me. Oh. Isn't it the same guy that developed them? Oh, might be. No, uh, Tay, I mean, Tay is an Tay. interesting example, though. I mean, Tay showcases what happens if you are optimistic about a system being able to learn from everything it sees. For those who don't know about Tay, Tay was an artificial intelligence chat system that people could interact with online. I think it was on Twitter. And the system was set up in a completely <coughs> naive, completely impressionable mode. Basically, it learned from every single interaction. So humans being humans and humans behind keyboards being you know, somewhat less than that, you ended up with a system that had learned a lot of really, really, shall we say, rude things. But though Tay is a fun example over social media and, and vulgarity, the lesson from Tay is still relevant to today. Any system you, you create that's based on AI learns from the data you give it. So in more complex examples, that quality of that data is going to be one of the most important things with your AI system, just as much, if not more so, than your algorithm itself. Right. So here's your you know, take home definition for AI. It's the theory and development of computer systems that uh, mimic uh, or perform tasks that are normally required human intelligence. Um, we like to think of it as the human in the middle or the human in the loop because um, most of these AI solutions are really fit for purpose. Um, so some, some of the AI solutions that you see out there that are relevant to uh, today are speech and vision, natural language processing, natural lang language translation, image processing, recognition, uh, categorization, um, uh, machine learning, so being able to actually learn, you know, create a framework that actually learns particular patterns. One of the things that uh, we have been doing is working with NASA to use drone images uh, on, on rockets before they're launched to determine if there are uh, uh, failure patterns. Um, normally, it would take engineers to walk around the tower, and then as you know, they have to eventually remove the uh, walk tower um, from the uh, rocket because it's going to take off. But a drone can be there until the very last minute and pick out uh, anomalies at uh, pretty much uh, machine speed uh, if, it, if it gets an enough patterns of failure um, categorized. Uh, expert systems and robotics. Now, my lab has three or four different robots. Yep. And, um, you know, Michael uh, and I just really love these things. They can be such a pain in the butt to, to work with. Everybody loves them, though, don't they, Michael? Oh, yeah. I mean, robots are one of those. Uh, I think they'll, they're the media darlings right now when it comes to the AI space. 
If your robot is impressive enough, people will think your AI system is impeccable. But if you run out with a cardboard robot, and I know because I have one, IBM open sourced one, people are not so impressed. But you know, whatever the form factor is, robot, website, mobile application, that still exists separate from the AI system itself. Yep. In the case of a robot, you may have multiple sensors, multiple inputs, similar to the case of smart cities that we heard earlier. Right? A robot might see, a robot might hear, but it's an AI system on the back end that's taking that vision and categorizing, oh, that's Andros, oh, that's Michael. Taking the audio and recognizing, oh, they're speaking English, and oh, he's saying hello to me. And then taking some other algorithm to say, oh, I should probably say hi back. But in the end, separate the robot and the inputs from the AI model itself. Most yep. people confuse the two. So humans love form factors uh, that are, you know, that they can relate to. A little bit of latex and fake hair goes a long way. But it's not, it, you know, that's really not the solution that you have to think about. It's, uh, and many of these robots, by the way, are, are not as easy to maintain <laughs> as we thought they were. Uh, they uh, overheat, uh, the gears break down, um, and so on and so forth. So we've had plenty of uh, experience with that. Um, I went into Incheon Airport on my way over here, and they have a uh, uh, one of the uh, iRobot uh, form factors providing information about gates and time of flights and so on and so forth. And as I walked up to it, it decided that it needed to dock because it had run out of power. So I didn't get the opportunity to play with it. It, it said, I'm sorry, I have to find my docking station. <laughs> um, so... What we have is, you know, essentially this perception of what AI is, you know, between machine learning uh, of uh, the scientific and, and uh, academic space through to this uh, concept of artificial intelligence like HAL. Um, and, you know, it's all really relevant somewhere here in the middle. Um, Watson is real, but Watson for playing Jeopardy uh, was a fit-for-purpose system that cost billions of dollars to, to make and filled a room like this of computers. So is it practicable? I hardly think so. Was it useful for IBM to build frameworks to learn how to actually provide business solutions? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, <coughs> why are we really talking about AI today? Um, though, you know, Carrie and I went to school and we learned backpropagation and neural networking and annealing and all sorts of crazy algorithms and um, those algorithms are the, really the same algorithms as that we're using today with minor differences and tweaks. Well, why is it that, what, that AI has come, you know, here and into the fold today? Well, one is uh, the ubiquity of computing power, storage, massive amounts of storage, compute, uh, and networking. Um, so cloud computing. Uh, the other is uh, the vast amount of data that we're generating um, because of uh, these great little things, you know, these mobile devices that we all have. And those mobile devices are generating information that is used as to train uh, the algorithm. So lots of training data, and lots of training data that's provided in real time. The other is uh, the miniaturization of devices in general, um, specifically uh, devices like uh, you know um, accelerometers and temperature devices, and you know this device. I think this uh, uh, cell, my particular phone is a, uh, a um, iPhone. XR, just got it not so long ago, and it has uh, like 300 different um, measuring devices in it. One of them is barometric pressure, and if you're using an IBM uh, weather app, because we own the weather company, um, we're actually using you as a little weather station. It's part of the agreement with EULA when you download the app. Your phone is taking barometric pressure, and we're pumping that data back into IBM and learning about what the local weather is. But I, I think it's important to, to recognize that you know, we're not unique in doing that. No. There are other um, apps that likely everyone here uses about traffic of some kind. And when you use that traffic app and it tells you when you're going to get there, you find out mid-route it lies to you, right? And it shows you you're going to get there 20 minutes later. That insight, that real-time data insight, whether it's in Google, they, they use green, yellow, and red as a way to distinguish how, how much
much traffic there is. That's all user generated. And it's not obvious at first if you just use something like Google Maps. So if you use another app like Waze, Waze is all about user input. You are prompted, you are told, hey, there's traffic here. Do you agree? You click yes or no. And in these small kinds of interactions enabled by these portable computers, we're creating data that can feed AI models, that can feed AI systems, whether it's something that just says, here's the weather according to the phones in this room, or whether it's something that says, you know, I'm fairly certain there's bad traffic in, in, uh, down here, in, here in Singapore because of all these cars and all the phones inside the cars. So the diagram in the back of me uh, shows uh, essentially the difference between cognitive, machine learning, and AI. Um, AI is a convergence set of technologies. Uh, cognitive computing is prescriptive analytics, essentially, and machine learning are those algorithms like neural nets that actually allow you to um, identify patterns, visualizations, for example. Um, this robot up here is a robot the NASA folks uh, created, right? Wasn't it NASA? No, um, I think. Oh, sorry, it's EBC. Um, I knew it was one of those big organizations. So anyway, it's BBC created uh, this robot, some of the engineers. And really, again, this kind of speaks back to why AI is becoming so interesting is the miniaturization of all these devices that create you know, uh, relevant, real-time uh, data streams that can be used um, to make decisions around these decision frameworks. builds, Michael. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to let Michael say a lot about this because he knows uh, quite a bit. But ge generally speaking, there's two types, and I talked a little bit about this, uh, two categories of, of AI. There's generalized and, and then there's specialized. And it's not intuitive as to which is what. Um, so when you use these new modern day frameworks for business, uh, there are specialized frameworks. A lot of the work has been done for you. They're essentially neuro, neuro learning algorithms that have been built for you to use for your business, whereas the specialized is a lot of pieces, parts that you would have to put a, a significant development effort behind, fund it, and then develop some solution from those parts. And we offer those parts as in, like any other company, we have a partnership with Google, we have a, a machine called Power AI, which has all of this stuff built into it. Um, and we're using that quite a bit uh, as well. But quite frankly, for you, you're not going to spend $60 million for a relatively minor um, project in your business uh, and then have to sustain that. Um, maybe Netflix, maybe Google, maybe Amazon, maybe IBM, you know, these these innovators of innovators, they're going to do this, but not you. You're going to use democratized APIs and fit-for-purpose solutions. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I really think it's, it's what you see in front of you here that is really responsible for the AI explosion that we see today. Um, on the right side, the general pur my right, your left, the general purpose AI frameworks are very powerful because they are a tool set. So if you have some problem that you want to apply AI to, and you have the time, the skills, the funding, or the desire to learn all, any of that, go crazy. And with those sets of frameworks, you could build a model to abstract any kind of problem, connect it, point it to your data, teach it how to understand your data, make your data good, curate it well, and off you go. That effort, though a noble and worthwhile effort for certain kinds of business problems, has a lot of work involved with it. The majority of AI projects do not pursue something like this. That's what we're generally seeing. Instead, to try to make AI more accessible, and Andras used the word IBM likes, democratized, you have this idea of specialized AI frameworks. You can think of these as AI prepackaged for a use case that is as easy as connecting to Twitter. With any of these capabilities, all one has to do as a developer is get some API key, read some documentation, and throw data at an endpoint and you get back some kind of AI brilliance that you then embed into your business logic that makes your team look like a bunch of professionals. This is what has made AI explode. Over even hackathons, right? I've had opportunities to work with first or second semester computer science students, people with low coding backgrounds. Again, give them documentation and 
a web service, and even they're able to start running with AI. The caveat with these specialized AI frameworks that IBM and other vendors provide is that you have to understand how are these different AI use cases spelled out, what use cases do these different services address, and will they address my use case? This is where vendors like IBM and our system integrator partners and the system integrators of the world are really showing expertise. That clients come to them and say, here's my problem, you know, I want to build a chat bot or I want to build a question and answer system. And then based on you know, details and requirements, you end up with a recommendation, oh, IBM's got a capability. Maybe Amazon, maybe Google, maybe Microsoft, maybe some other company not shown here. But it's this ease of access that is really fueling the AI explosion and the innovation and the fact that everyone everywhere is doing AI something. Again, there's still goodness in the general purpose world, but the prerequisite of deep expertise such as you know, PhDs, machine learning, maybe even an AI background makes that not as common. I mean, if I'm to be candid, I don't have formalized machine learning AI training, but I've done a number of implementations with a number of clients thanks to many of the democratized capabilities of specialized AI. So this is where we see much of that action today. And, and I do, but I would say Michael is uh, even ahead of me because he's spent a lot of time with these uh, frameworks. And it's really in these frameworks that we're beginning to see the application of AI in general. So you have the, you know, the innovator's innovator using these really deep um, uh, you know, learning frameworks in PyTorch and CAFE and so on and so forth, instead of actually hand coding them you know, from research papers, which you could, you know, buy uh, 60 or 70 uh, really high-powered PhDs to go do, now you actually have this wrapped up in a package that you could, you know, basically spend half that. And then you're going to try to apply it to your own business. It's still, you know, a, uh, a, a long mountain to climb, a high, a high mountain to climb, uh, but uh, it, it, it's come down quite a bit. And so you're seeing a lot of innovation that is coming out of uh, the general purpose space. So the specialized space, you know, had tr traditionally been um, all cloud-based, but now we're seeing second generation AI um, for the enterprise, and you're seeing uh, many of these uh, AI frameworks actually be available for your enterprise on-prem. Um, up until recently, you only had the API implementation. Now, there's still API based in, in the development approach, but the, um, the solution is, is uh, ending up on things like uh, um, OpenShift and IBM ICP, IBM Cloud Private, that is being installed in the enterprise itself. So uh, as a result, you're seeing some of the heavier duty you know, still large, uh, largely expensive solutions like uh, IBM, as an example, IBM machine learning be API based, which is relatively new. So Michael, tell me all about these lovely cats and dogs. Certainly, and we'll, we'll buzz through this to keep on schedule here with about a minute left. So when it comes to understanding machine learning, um, again, in this session, we're not going to give you a very deep explanation. There's plenty of great resources. We have two folks who've asked themselves as having formalized education on it. But at a high level, you can think of learning as either supervised or unsupervised. In the case of supervised learning, you provide data to a system and you label it. In our example, because I love dogs, not so much cats, but they're tolerable, <laughs> we bring a bunch of pictures of animals to I'm, a system. I'm a cat person. He is a cat person. We bring a bunch of pictures, and for every picture, we might label it dog or cat. Optionally, we might have another set that's called negative, and that's neither dogs nor cats, some lesser animal that's not fit to be a pet. As you give the system picture after picture, and you say, this is a dog, this is a cat, this is a dog, this is a cat, the system has a memory of what makes a dog and what makes a cat. Now, for this to be good, you want to use different types of dogs and different types of cats. That way, when you then submit to a system a new picture, it looks at it and says, do I think this is the thing you showed me that you called a dog? Do I think it's something that called a cat? Or do I think it's none of the above? This type of system takes advantage of some of the machine learning methods, such as regression and classification. But all you really care about from a business standpoint is, is this a dog or is this a cat? I know amongst many of your clients and your own businesses, you likely can think of a few problems where you want to know what type of a thing is it. Very simple, basic problem. And so supervised learning can be used to do some of that. On the other side, we have unsupervised learning. And this is based on methods like clustering. In this case, 
you just throw all your pictures at the system and you do not give labels to your data. So you don't use the word dog or cat or not dog or not cat. You just throw the data and the system looks at the data, figures out you know, what are the ways that this data can be related to itself and then using creates clusters. Using established patterns. Yep, using established patterns or it might infer them on its own based on the type of learning. And at the end of the day, you end up with, oh, these two cutie pie pops look very similar. I don't know why. Well, you know, I, they have fur, they have cute little button noses, right? I've got ideas. And by the way, these somewhat cute, mean-looking cats, <laughs> they're all one other group. I know because they've got the pointy ears, they've got a very stern look, and they've got wide eyes. In this way, you know, we can teach the system the same thing, but by telling it explicitly where we know the language we want and the outcome we want, we're letting the system come to its own conclusion when we don't really know what are the patterns to be identified. I hear cats are better judgment characters than dogs. Um, so there, there's machine learning and then there's deep learning. Uh, and from where I stand, Michael, uh, deep learning is really all about things like back, back propagation and the ability to actually um, learn uh, from other AI learning frameworks. What, what is it for you? Deep learning? Yeah. Well, when I think of deep learning, I think of pulling humans further and further out of the problem. Because when I think of classical machine learning, I think of you know, the person in that chair spending time trying to figure out what are the meaningful features, is the word we use, in our data, right? In the case of our cat and dog example, right, you might have fur versus hair. You might have nose, you might have eyes, you might have the prevalence of whiskers. A human can do that in general machine learning, but in deep learning, we tend to leave that up to the system. So what you're saying is that in machine learning, um, I need to basically describe that a dog has a body and it might have four legs in an image and it has a squarer face than a cat, but a cat has pointy ears and a, and a thin tail. And then try and see what your outcome is when you run it through the neural and then you go back and change the scoring, right? Yep. So in deep learning, you're using things like um, IBM's recent neural chip. What's the name of the neural chip? Oh, you caught me. I don't know that uh, one. Oh, come on. <laughs> uh, so, so we have actually a, uh, a, a deep learning um, chip that is used to actually program deep learning algorithms. And deep learning algorithms usually take multiple layers of learning, uh, machine learning, and use back propagation um, and automates feature extraction from already set patterns. So it's a, it's a lot more complicated and, it, and it's 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 kind of closer to the metal, but you can get um, you know better results if you're looking for something very very specific. So, any questions up to this point? Oh. Do, we, do we need to grab the mic? Uh, yeah, I guess I'm in a better place than Meryl. Well, they want you. I think they want you on the recording. Is the thing? Yeah, the mic's right here. What? Ah, oh, there it is. All right, and we got to get you for the people in the cheap seats. Go ahead. Yep. So, two questions actually. Great presentation, by the way. I like the uh, dual presenter format. Um, a particular thought leader that we all know well has expressed concern over AI. Elon Musk. Yeah, and has labeled it an existential threat. Right. Question one would be your thoughts on that. And then secondly, closely related is thoughts on um, national or international regulatory bodies right. that should be looking at uh, right. AI R&D. So uh, yeah, g great two questions. So let's talk about um, Elon Musk a little bit. I think, I think you know, setting aside the fact that he likes to be controversial and uh, stir up dialogue, which is good, because I think this uh, entire space is going to move very quickly. Um, but beyond that, um, he, he probably benefits more from AI than any person in this city, right? His, you know, self-driving vehicles are AI systems, right? Um, so he gets to see this stuff in real time, and I think that he said it himself that he's, you know, kind of amazed at, at how quickly that this has all evolved, and he's concerned with, you know, the fact that you might have machines, 
that um, are thinking at speeds faster than, than humans. I absolutely think you're going to find a machine that is better at a particular set of data, you know, of finding the answer using natural language processing than a human is going to. And that's true today, too. But the question is, will machines ever be able to reason and is being alive, like, you know, being an organism uh, that is a living animal, give you a leg up in many ways? Um, and that, and this is a very existential question some people are asking, and it goes all the way down to quantum mechanics. Um, but uh, for example, one of the things that make you very unique is that um, uh, you don't live forever. So there, there, and you you have survival in the real world that you're faced with. So there may be some experiences that you will always have that a machine will never have in its current form. Now, if it, if I believe personally that we will, in the further future, probably not be replaced by machines, but integrate, um, you know, devices and uh, technology uh, into the human uh, experience. In fact, a lot of folks say that this right here already is an integrated, integrated with you. I don't know how many of you had this experience where you put your phone down, leave it, um, and then somebody says, you know, well, when is that ball game or something? And you immediately think, I need to enter that information into my phone. And your brain has already integrated um, this technology into your, the fiber of your being. So technology is actually um, becoming more part of the human. So we are probably heading more towards being a cyborg and being something different um, than having a machine replace humans. That's what I think. Now, if you want to read something entertaining that along the same lines, go check out the most recent book uh, uh, the, by the guy who did uh, Da Vinci's Code, uh, Origins. Um, it's, uh, it's really relevant to the conversation that we're having today. I won't spoil it for you. Okay. So the other question was, um, So we have heard people in the uh, federal government space in multiple countries, in the EU and, and the UK, talk about, uh, uh, what is the euphemism they use? I love it. It's called algorithmic transparency. So uh, I, there is an algorithmic transparency today. So why they believe there is going to be just simply because we're using al learning algorithms, I don't really understand that. But um, AI and learning algorithms uh, are still dependent on the uh, business process being defined. So the business process, the step one through A, you know, what it is that we want these systems to do is still very much, you know, part of a solution. Um, that ha isn't going to go away. It doesn't just magically decide how it's going to serve your customer. You, you define how you're going to use these machine learning algorithms in the context of the overall business process. Um, and, uh, and, and in so much as that the government uh, would like to have transparency for its citizens or the other way around, um, I, I agree that they, everybody should understand how they're being treated you know, in the systems that are supposed to reflect the law. You know, we're constantly updating government systems to reflect changes in the law. Um, but how do you know they're right? Um, well, you have some oversight, right? I guess. That's a good question. So there is a reason to be concerned about whether or not the, the IT systems that we have today reflect the, um, the outcomes we expect with respect to the law and how we treat our citizens. Yeah, let me, let me direct. And, I, and I'll add one thing to that answer that Andros just provided. Um, in my work, at least, I find most of the bias from AI systems is intentionally provided to match cultural expectations. AI systems may show you something that you may not like about your business process and 
there's a tendency to just rig the system a little to the left so it tells you what you want to hear. This is not uncommon, and we're likely to see a lot of it probably for the next maybe decade, maybe less. Um, and so laws coming and bringing any kind of regulation are not going to fix that. And that's going to be an evolution of business, I think. Yeah, later, later on, by the way, we'll talk about bias. And um, we'll use some really good examples that have come out recently uh, around bias. Good. Your comment about the law changing the system to match the law, my understanding of those kinds of things requires a lawyer and or many lawyers and or a judge and or a Supreme Court to get involved. So interpreting the law is in and of itself perhaps a, a, a requirement for machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm yeah, I, I, I mean my I point was simply that um, you know we have IT systems that are out there today that are reflections of our um, you know legal, legal and social framework, and uh, you you have to ask yourself: Are they really reflective of what the the goal was ultimately? And you don't know as a citizen. Most people just take it as for granted. Let's do one more question, and then I think we need to move on. I'm pretty sure I turned it on. Go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> the question here is uh, regarding the ROI. Uh, the common business, uh, because what everybody is talking about is the AI, if you want to implement, uh, the cost is big, and uh, because that's one of the scary stuff, most of the society are the business for the SME, mainly the SME layer, they are not ready to take a call, but um, uh, what is the call, what will be the transition is going to be happening, like now it's very much specific to some industries, as you mentioned, uh, some of the industries still they are scared about that because the data of the volume data, what you are going to analyze, that is one of the counting. Uh, this one, it going to take bigger cost, and they are not able to spend it. Uh, but again, uh, the everybody is going towards the digital transformations, and this is one of the AI yeah, is only the way we can able to materialize it. Uh, this is uh, some gaps and the uh, technology influence factors. Wh where is going to match the either party? to have it one, the first question. Another one is on the uh, the same questions, regulations. Uh, as an individual, uh, like Alexa and uh, uh, Google assistants, uh, what what some, suddenly is what is happening? It's it's activated by the name. But if, if that is the case, always is recording all the information that means is hearing us. What is the security is there? What kind of private private privacy is there with the, with the home when you are in the uh, Alexa? Uh, Google Assistant, all your message will be recorded. Someone is using it so for some other purpose. Uh, what kind of, uh, that is one of the things maybe the regulator may be asking. Oh, we want to see the uh, your engine, how it's working first. Because are you taking only by command, and then it will be activating, or even in general, everything is going to be captured, right. and is going to be taking it right. for your own purpose. So, so let me answer the second question. Uh, it's actually quite interesting. So. There are companies that are offering, um, you know, free online social services, uh, you know, free services in general that they're using to analyze your behavior with and resell the data. Um, there are companies currently that are providing AI solutions that actually uh, use the information that you provide at a lower cost, and they reserve the right to learn about you know your use of the AI and the data that you store in their cloud. Um, that is uh, not my company's uh, approach. In fact, my company's approach is not to is to explicitly not compete with the with the entities that use our product. Um, but there are companies that are competing um, with those companies that are using their AI frameworks, and so you have to be uh, cognizant about the implications of that, uh, and and uh, and ultimately what happens. What do you think, Michael? Yeah, I mean the the saying's always been true, right? If um, if a service is provided to you for free, then you're not the customer; you're the product. And we know this in the case of our favorite email application, and perhaps a few others. And for those of us who just want free email, sweet free email, right? Even better, less slash fewer ads. And as an individual interacting with a big tech company, right, something that you know rhymes with Google, you 
say, that's not a big deal, right? I'm not in the email business. That doesn't really matter. But what, you know, what we see very often, as Andros was mentioning, is the cases where a business is, doing, is partnering with another business. And that other business also happens to do the same thing their, in this context, client does. And all the great analytics and insight, whatever they're provided by their technology partner, is now insight that that same technology partner can use to em enable their business to be more effective. Who, for, for instance, is in direct competition with this uh, customer in this context. So there's a lot of weirdness in, in the world of AI, similar to how you know, there's been weirdness around genetics. Like, I don't know how many of you all have done any genetic testing. I, my background is in, is in uh, bio, bioinformatics, so technology, genetics. Back, back in the 90s, this has been done on a, on, a, on a national scale in some countries, where they paid a whole company to DNA sequence everyone. That company went under, and as part of trying to come out from under the debt, sold off all that data. So in the case of things like 23andMe, I, I, I don't know that I'll do it unless someone forces me to, but people are happily spitting into these cups to find out your X percent, you know, whatever background. But once you've done that, you've given away that data. Now, I guess the average person isn't going to get into the business of DNA sequencing, but what if one of your, you know, DNA s sequences is like a wonder drug? Well, it's like narking on your future self, too, if you get yourself <laughs> into trouble, right? So I think it's a gray area where regulation still hasn't caught up that if you're providing AI services, capabilities, analytics, there is some level of transparency to say, hey, this is how we're using this data. Let me explain it to you in human readable language. And you can choose whether you still want to work with us or not. Yeah, in some uh, cases, you're OK if they read your email. And you don't mind, because you're not competing. In other cases, though, you may be a concern if your business is relying on it for enterprise function. Yeah. You don't want that to be used against you, either by that company or another one of your competitors using that same service. So you have to be cognizant of um, who you're using and whether they have parasitic kinds of uh, business practices. Because we have seen these companies actually launch, using this data, their own brands against the folks that are paying to use their platform. So uh, well, should we continue on, or what, what do we yeah, do? Yeah, I'd say we should continue on. We're a little bit behind, but I think we'll make it out OK. Urban Dictionary, for those who are wondering. Um, and uh, 
but we also realized that if you were going to be able to answer Jeopardy questions, that you're going to probably have to know everything about anatomy. Well, who owns all of the information about anatomy? The folks maybe who publish Grey's Anatomy. Well, are you, they going to give you uh, all of their content in machine-readable format for free? Guess what? The answer is no. Um, and it goes on and on and on and on. So somebody owns these data sets. By the way, we have actually acquired um, the rights to many of them. And we're allowing our customers to use them either for free or for, for a very low cost. Um, but if you go outside of our ecosystem, you're still going to have to use some of these reference sets. And when you use them, you're probably going to be paying somebody for royalties eventually. Anything yeah. else? Well, if you're, if you're a consultant and you're looking to figure out how to make millions and billions of dollars with AI, this is it. You can leave after this slide. Because this is really the journey that every organization will have to go on. The rest of our session here is great, I promise. But if you're a consultant, this is it. And what you'll find with many organizations is they don't um, have a way of thinking about these problems. For many of them, it's they hear new technology is in, is in the papers. Analysts say this thing is going to change the world. They hire a guy or pay someone to talk about how great this thing is, maybe spend some money and do a project, and then move on. In the case of AI, this has to be something that you prepare for and something that you build foundations to. So Andros talked about knowing your data. We'll go into detail what that looks like later. Understanding what's your relevant data. Again, you can have all the data in the world, but if you don't know which parts you care about, you can't really design an effective system around it. And we see this going all the way up to establishing trust in systems. Most people that have AI right now, they trust that the answers are good enough, but they don't really have a way to explain or justify it. Right. Earlier today, we heard someone assert that it's OK if a system does something and humans don't get it. I, I strongly disagree with that. And there are companies like IBM and others that are, have designed capabilities to help you understand what are the biases in your data. Because bias isn't inherently wrong. But you have to understand what the bias is right. to make the assertion that your AI is not unethical. Yeah. We're going to talk a little bit more about this later on, too. Yep. Um, but an AI system has a different maintenance life cycle than your IT system. So you're going to have to have the skill to be able to manage that AI system. That, that is somebody watching the training and constantly watching over the learning process. And you're going to have to have the, so that means there's going to be somebody who's representing the business who understands where the business is going to make sure that the outputs from the artificial intelligence are going in strategically in the, in the direction you yeah. want to in your organization. You're going to have to have somebody understanding the implications of training, making sure the data formats don't change. I mean, overnight, data formats can change. And then all of a sudden, your data might be training your AI system <laughs> to believe in something else. And we'll talk about what the implications of that is uh, as we go forward here. So an AI can be augmented intelligence, uh, not just artificial. What do you mean by that, Michael? Well, you know, AI as an artificial intelligence was the original name of much of this field. I believe it was also a movie about a cute little boy robot going home. But what IBM has found after actually applying AI, it makes more sense as augmented. You know, there are some people who are brilliant who wonder and worry that AI computers will replace humans at some point. But we still believe in the value of having a human individual, partially because it eases the complexity of ethical dilemmas. Like if the AI told me I should punch him and then I opted to follow through and punch him, that's still on me. That's not the AI system's fault. But if we had a robot here and the AI said to punch him and the robot punched him, then we have some complex moral dilemma. This accounts for... Uh, this helps account for errors in your AI. You know, I might look at the AI's analysis and say, I shouldn't punch this guy. He's a cool guy, and he, lo he knows a lot, and we work together. That's a really dumb idea. I can then correct the training data. So we see humans being a part of these processes as something critical. Because as a human being, I can see that data that comes out. I can see the recommendation. I can understand why, and then make an assertion of, is this surprising to me? Is there something about him I didn't know that says, oh, man, he really needs one? Or is this genuinely an error in the system? Yep. This is where I think many businesses are going to have real eureka moments. Also, they, too, Michael, don't forget that in many of the AI systems that we're building, we're putting the end user uh, in the place of helping train the system. So the end yep. user, if they are, you know, if they notice that the chatbot is off, yep. can actually give some really good feedback to us, and we'll show you how that works. That tells us that uh, the the 
the chatbot or the assistant is, and the neural network is not trained properly. Um, so how many of you guys know Grady Booch? Grady Booch? Yeah, you guys do? Yeah, so Grady is actually in IBM Research now. He's not really, you know, certainly he has passion around software archaeology these days, but he's really working on uh, Watson. He's doing a lot of work with NASA and, and, and uh, AI. Uh, and one of the things that he tackled was a think tank around, um, is, it, it, is it possible to have a singularity and any time in the near future, and when would that be? So the think tank that he led came to the conclusion that basically it was probably a couple of hundred years away, and then even then, um, you know, it, it's more difficult, as it turns out, for an intelligence to escape a form factor like a computing system than it is um, for us to integrate um, it into uh, our, our daily lives or our uh, existence as almost a cyborg-like, uh, you know, character that evolves into a more machine uh, kind of uh, uh, human experience. So we're really thinking about human in the loop here and not, you know, AI by itself, right? Yeah, I mean, that, that's essential as mentioned, right? Because the AI system may make a suggestion that is a horrible, horrible idea. And the AI system may make a suggestion that feels wrong, but when a human takes a look, they realize it's the right idea. And again, at times, the AI may make a suggestion that is fueled by the data, but that may need to be adjusted for cultural expectation, whether that's within the, the society or within the business alone. Human in the loop makes all of that much, much easier. And we see that as probably the way of the future for quite likely some time. A, <laughs> quite some time, right? Yeah. Uh, so there, there are, we have seen some customers who come to us, um, especially on the fintech side, Yep. And they say, you know, what we're looking for is a predictive model uh, that tells us when there's going to be a next economic downturn um, or something just crazy like this. And then they give us uh, their data. And the, there's a lot of, you know, <laughs> uh, craziness in this. Like, for example, all of these financial institutions have analysts. All the analysts write uh, basically <coughs> reports in different formats. Um, in unstructured uh, on a format, usually it, that ends up in a PDF. Uh, and each one has their own way of characterizing the information that they're providing. So trying to synthesize information and even tear apart uh, the data in these reports um, is very difficult. So that's the first problem. The second problem is, you know, doing predictive and analytics is not AI so much as it is analytical science, which gives you a range of potential predictive options. And so um, folks, again, have made you know, some misunderstanding about what AI is versus um, analytics uh, and statistical analysis uh, and the implications of the data itself. Yeah, I mean, this is where you know, good marketing can go too far, right? People see AI and they see the way it's portrayed, and IBM has the best and worst commercials simultaneously, where we position AI as this wonderkin, as a silver bullet. In many ways, AI can be a silver bullet because it addresses a domain of problems that prior have been really hard to address. But when it comes to building a system to do something novel that's game-changing for your enterprise, it doesn't all have to be AI. I mean, Andros's examples come from uh, a client that we're still happily partnering with, and their initial understanding was, just give this data in a random format to AI and tell it economics. Yeah, the other area <laughs> that I we get into where uh, folks want to use AI quite a bit um, is uh, cybersecurity. They, yeah. uh, they say that you know, you've got all this log data and all this information, and you are generating a lot of it, especially if you've got a SIM uh, that's running on you know, a lot of your devices. Um, but how do you find the, you know, the needle in the haystack? And how do you predict the next attack? And this is something that my team actually worked on quite significantly with IBM Research. Turns out, it's it's a really really gnarly problem. You can't really predict something that has no basis for understanding, because every single cyber attack is kind of a one-off. And so you can predict, uh, you can baseline what is normal performance. 
a few interesting, really interesting AI-based machine learning cyber uh, solutions. And my team actually was the original developer of the IBM cybersecurity solution, IBM, you know, sci uh, Wat uh, uh, Q Radar with Watson. Q, Q Radar with Watson or Watson Cyber. And what it does is it helps you actually take all this information about cyber threats and curates it and gives it to you in a, in a way uh, that correlates it to the type of attack that you might be experiencing. So you can do that. That's not a problem. And that is AI. Um, but it's not actually you know, trying to find the, un, uh, the unknown attack vector, right? Which isn't really possible. And I think it's worth emphasizing here that you know, for a company like IBM that we sell IT, this made sense for us to pursue because we have a security product, we have AI capability, and we have clever people and teams led by guys like this who say, we'll take on that problem and we'll address it. But if you're an enterprise that doesn't have that budget, but you still want to do AI and security, you're back to our earlier slide. Do I want to try to do this by myself? Do I believe I have a skill set and a need to build a custom approach? You might. I can't speak for every business out there. Is it feasible and reasonable for you to buy a vendor-provided product that might have that kind of capability integrated within? I mean, this is where we go back to the notion of democratized AI. And so when we talk about picking the right projects, my biggest thing is always figure out what's been done before. If there's models and data and a vendor like IBM or others who have a thing you can use <coughs> that does most of what you need, and all you have to do is just curate your data and send it in real time, that's a good project. But if you do something that no one's ever done before, that's a hard project. And if you're a company that wants to sell AI solutions, great. If you're not, you know, be prepared for a, I won't say life-changing experience, but a lot of good lessons learned. So when you go into a, uh, a project, Michael, I mean, what do you look for? I look for, you know, I, I look at the data first, right? Do they own the data? Is it structured in any way? How much effort am I going to actually expend to cleanse it and put it some, into some format? And is it learnable, right? AI wants to learn from the data. So if you've got data that's you know, spewing out of a giant pipe you know, in real time, that's good data in a lot of ways. If you're talking about a very small you know, set of data that doesn't really change very often, then it's not really very interesting. What do you think? No, I, you're exactly right. I mean, the hardest problems in AI right now where the algorithms are known are hard because the data's not there. And, you know, there's all kinds of uh, really cool um, approaches to um, making up, I won't say falsifying, making data from existing data. Yeah. We call it data synthesis. It's a better word than lying. It's where you take whatever you have and modify it to better represent reality. It's because, the you know, the, the reality of the world is him and I can work together over several months and create a great chatbot that says great things. But we don't know what any of you are going to ask. We can come up with a hundred ways to say, what is the open group? And I bet someone in this room or someone in, in this conference is likely to come up with a hundred and one way that we didn't think of that is nothing like our other hundred ways. So the AI still misses it. And that's just the reality of things. So when you have a lot of data, that gives you some greater semblance of having a better system early on. Probably the core of your business. Probably, right. Yeah. So uh, tell us about this chart. I mean, there's lots of different um, roles that now get established in, in your enterprise that you have to consider that you probably haven't considered before that uh, interact in ways that never interacted before, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's exactly right. When you think AI, I know the tendency is to think of IT alone, and we put on our propeller hats and say, we'll go fix it, right? We get a wrench and start banging on something. But the reality is this problem, this domain, is, is, is very unique in terms of the groups that have to come together. I mean, at the core, you have, I, I would say at the core, you know, I like this chart mostly, but at the core is some business process owner. That's my take on it. You have someone that has a need. They have something that they're trying to do, and there's an opportunity to do it better, right? Maybe they have to write, read a uh, 100 documents every month, and that takes a lot of their time. Maybe they have to write minutes every week, and that takes a lot of their time. And they have this great idea that if only they could have a system that could do some of that work, they could do greater things. They could focus on the harder problems. You connect that person who knows the problem space, who knows what the business is trying to do, and you start connecting them with these other pieces. You, you might elevate that up to the CIO or CTO and say, hey, we want to look at new ways to address this. We might then go to our data science folks and say,
and say, hey, what data do we have? That Can is if you have data science folks. That is if you have data science folks. So you have to have some data science folks eventually. Eventually, that's correct. And you've got to have a CTO organization who's kind of thinking about things outside of the box, right? That uh, definitely helps, that's for sure. Yeah. So, and then you need the de developers to understand what it means to actually develop these applications because these are very different than the normal structured programming of Java and C and C++. Yep. Yeah. Anything else? Well, you've got your ops for AI piece, right? So we, so we talk about data, we talk about, you know, your data scientists can say, here's the data we have, here's a way we think we can build a model around it. Andros mentioned the app developers who build the pretty front end that does the thing that connects you to the AI. But then separate from that, you have this ops for AI piece. And this is perhaps one of the most critical pieces in this whole picture. And these are your, your doctors, your nurses, your caretakers of your AI system. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't like to call it children, but think of it like a pet. You have to care and feed it. You have to occasionally ask it to sit, to stand, to roll over. And you have to validate that it's doing the thing you expect it to do in the way that you expect it to do it. Because those developers are off on a new project, right? These are guys that are watching things operationally, right? Oh, yeah. And, and the beauty of it, at least for some vendors, IBM, I give us credit as being one of them, these systems exist in a loose coupling. So if your AI folks decide that they need to pivot because the business process realizes you know, the business is going in a new direction, that can all be done in your <laughs> wonderful new front end that looks pretty and renders on phones nicely. That remains relevant. You might need a few tweaks here and there if things go change significantly, but generally it remains stable. And we see that as important because this AI model, you might have a nice little mobile website, you might have a big enterprise application, you might have a reporting system, and all of those different applications may use the same underlying AI model for different business processes. Yep. So separate the model creation from the application development. I, I think you kind of talked a little bit about that. So. Um, the ideation, the design thinking phase, the data scientist who's trying to figure out whether this is actually going to work or not, they're really different from the app developers who are being given, you know, kind of the template for how you want to integrate this into your overall IT environment. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. I mean, this to me is critical. This is the slide I carry into every customer moving forward. Because when they think of an AI system being created, they want to call it software. They say, yep. You'll write it, you'll have your Java guy sitting next to your AI guy and, or gal, and they'll, they'll do it, and they'll be done. But the reality is the AI work, frankly, kind of never ends, and that's not a bad thing. At the same time, you likely want your AI model, your AI part of the system, to be ready a little earlier than your application. Because in the process of building AI, you always learn something. Yeah. And you might realize that you characterized your business problem in a way that doesn't really make sense for the AI system you're trying to build. And what you don't want to do is have a finished, beautiful front-end application that then is built on an understanding that's dated of your AI model, because that might include some rework. So, Michael, uh, since you're millennial-ish, uh, I'm technically a millennial. You can call me a millennial. I, I won't get upset. Well, we got Z's out there now too. <laughs> My daughter is in design thinking, and uh, I mean d industrial design, so she's a Z. So you're 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 getting on soon. They'll be talking about. <sighs> Gray hair already. So, so, but, but tell me, I mean, you're programming in a whole different set of skills and programming languages than in the last even five years. What, what, you know, give me an example of some of the, you know, programming skills that are relevant to actually doing this work. I would say the biggest one is, is, and I want to connect it to design thinking a little bit, right? The, 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 the thing in the AI programming world, right? Whatever language you use, I, it's ultimately irrelevant, right? You could likely integrate AI with COBOL if you wanted to. I'm not sure why you would, but you could. Where the new set of skills that's required here, and, and customer by customer will have a different opinion about who owns these skills, it's going to be around understanding how to look at a business problem and determine what kind of AI system you want to create for that and understanding how to tweak and shape the AI model to fit. Because even if you're on the far left, again, my left, your right, of specialized systems that have an API, you pull an API key, you throw data, you get you know, insight back, there's still expertise required to say, how do I go from natural language understanding to a meaningful application, like a chatbot? How do, how do I do that abstraction down to something the AI model can understand? So that, I find, goes hand in hand with design thinking. It goes hand in hand with understanding how to you know, 
shape your problem in terms of the AI can understand and operationalize? That was a very uh, millennial non-answer to the question <laughs> I asked. But I'll answer it for you. Sure. Um, uh, so when I started working with Michael and I started working with some of the, the AI frameworks, um, I realized that uh, Python was used heavily. Uh, JavaScript is a foundational requirement, but JSON on top of that, Node-RED. Um, and general uh, scripting and, uh, and, and big data databases like CouchDB and, and, uh, and several others like CloudIn. If you don't have those skills, I'm telling you, every single one of these frameworks is using those programming language to ma manipulate data. So it's, it's a, it was an interesting experience for me that I had to catch up to because I was a Java C++ C guy. And uh, so I had to learn all these uh, all these interpreted languages. Well, to be fair, you can still use Java. We even support it as an SDK. I know, but that's not what you've seen the most of, uh, <laughs> you know, folks That's using. fair. So we're back to another Q&A uh, period. How much time we got? We got 28 minutes before the break, so we're behind by quite a bit. <laughs> all right. Well, um, we'll take a question. There go we ahead. go. So who's got, who's got the question? Can I see the hand again? There we go. Let me bring you the mic. Thank you. Um, you, co you covered a couple of items there in terms of data and also um, uh, structured data and unstructured data as well, uh, which brings a couple of questions to my mind. And we're talking about using AI for business processes. So uh, it, would it be an incorrect assumption that you could use AI to point out or bring about a business process that needs to be resolved by just using uh, unstructured data because sometimes data could be clean, data could not be clean as well. So could you then apply artificial intelligence on either unstructured data which is not clean to help improve the business process? Sure, absolutely. I mean, that's part of data cleansing. Um, we do that all the time. In fact, we have annotators now uh, that take information and scrub it from uh, PDF files in fact, Michael's going to go through a whole painstaking effort that we took uh, TOGEF and we pulled it into Discovery, um, Watson Discovery. And um, it, what we found out was that uh, there wasn't, even though you know you look at TOGEF and you look at the book and it looks like there is a standard set of structured uh, uh, par uh, chapters and sub-chapters and so on and so forth, um, it, you had to actually use a little... Uh, exponential data wrangling uh, cleansing skills to figure out you know where a chapter began and, and a section header and a, and a different uh, sub subtypes so that you could actually categorize those and feed it into Watson because otherwise um, you just get this giant blob of text and it, and it becomes uh, non-context sensitive is I guess is that the right yeah I mean you know human readable is not necessarily machine readable We've known this for quite some time, but the reality is some of the great sources of insight to feed AI systems, and it's to the point where companies like IBM have created products around this, take advantage of data in forms that we never really built for anything other than people, so they just needed to yep. look nice. That's right. So we'll, we'll show in one of our examples how even some of the great open standards that are out there were built for human consumption. And so putting them into a computer system is a little tricky because they represent combined human expertise. There's no single database of TOGAF because TOGAF is a complex thing, a lot of great insight, ideas, and guidance. So we'll show a little bit about the process and show you the end result of the kind of systems you have and the kind of value they can provide. Yeah. All right. We're going to take a break? Uh, no, one more. We do three, and then the break is 3.30. Uh, then we just keep going. So we've got 15 minutes until the break. Implementation best practices. All right. So uh, it starts with data. We talked a little bit. Maybe we can... We, we can probably zip through this as a speed uh, Evaluate sure. a continuum of problems, handling uh, easy AI, uh, and addressing harder ones. Um, so, so this this is my uh, favorite uh, slide. His least favorite slide. I've just heard, heard this story a few times. <coughs> so my son, um, uh, we, we live in a neighborhood where there is a grocery store chain called Harris Teeter. And when he was very young, uh, three or so years old, um, you know, we said we were going to Harris Teeter, and he goes, oh, we're going to Harris Teeter Totter, and we were like, yeah, that's, that's a great name for that grocery store, we'll just call that Harris Teeter Totter from now on out, and we, and my wife would go, hey, I'm going over to Harris Teeter Totter, and I'm like, yeah, oh, 
and 17 years went by and we were out in the parking lot going to my parents house and we dropped by Harris Teeter because we need to pick something up and we were in the parking lot uh, talking about what it is that we need to get and we're, we're having this heated discussion between my wife and I and no I don't really think you know, no you have to bring wine and all of a sudden my son goes hey it's not Harris Teeter totter it's Harris Teeter well why is that important or relevant here because you can teach an AI the wrong thing and essentially my son kind of learned you know it wasn't intentionally mean we all thought it was an open joke, but he never realized it and never really read Harris Teeter. He just thought, you know, in his mind, saw Harris Teeter Totter. Your AI can do very similar. It can learn the wrong thing and give you the wrong answer. And so you have to test your AI against reference data to make sure that it's le at least on the right path and then make an incremental step as you go on to train it for more instances. Michael, do you have anything to oh, say? The, the critical assumption in what you've just shared is reference data. This is why in that nice ladder, right, the consultancy cheat sheet, the foundation is having your data. If you don't really have a reference data set of whatever you're trying to characterize, this becomes super hard. If none of the Harris Teeters had any kind of signage, his son would still be calling it Harris Teeter Totter. It would be the world's longest lived open joke. So <laughs> without reference data, right, without having a sense of what's happening in your business and what's the data that says, yes, this just happened, AI becomes a much harder problem because you don't know if you're right or not. Hence why we think it starts with the data. Without the data, there can really be no AI that's central to your business beyond simple solved problems like visual recognition of a car or you know, um, natural language processing based on maybe an existing model like the one in IBM Watson or other vendors. So if you want to create something super customized to your enterprise, you'll need to have that data available. Otherwise, it's, I don't, I don't want to say impossible, but it's probably close to that. Or you're going to have to acquire it from somebody. Right. Yeah. All right, so you got to know your data too. Right. That means you have to actually have some you know, map or data governance uh, to understand what data you have. And, and that's really back to EA, right? Because without the data continuum in EA, then you don't really have an idea of, of what data your enterprise has and what structure it's in. So that's going to be kind of a starting point. You know, who's the data scientist or the DBA or the data team that owns your data repository? Right, and if you, again, another consultancy pro tip, if you want to really seem like a, like a sweet expert and your client says you want to do AI, just ask what data they have. And once you get a sense of the data they have, many of the AI ideas aren't connected to the availability of data. But if you look at the existing data set and say, here's what we have, here's what we think it will tell us, then you have a basis to start figuring out you know, what might be a reasonable project. Like if I want to understand how people feel about me based on the text they send after we go out on a lunch. I have no way of solving that because I'm not a government agency with texts from everyone's phones. If, however, it was in a group chat and I wanted to see you know, what the group chat was talking about and how they felt, if I'm in that group chat, I can download all those texts and I can do analysis on sentiment of the group around you know, different topics. But it, it's all about the data you have. So before you come up with some crazy idea, figure out, do I have data that supports it? Or can I buy data that supports it? Can I get rights to it, as Andros mentioned? And is it annotated? <laughs> well, right. Yeah, so if it's uh, not annotated and uh, nobody really understands the meaning of your data, you're in big trouble. Um, so there is a pipeline of data that feeds into AI, right? And, you know, the data warehouse of the past, you know, really kind of it informs the use of our AI engine. Yep. Because um, ETLM and uh, transformation is now a thing, right? So you still have to do that. So what do you think? Well, I mean, in the case of AI systems, what I like, and this is a, perhaps it's just novel to me because this is the first time I've encountered it, but the reality that you can feed some kind of big data AI analysis system starting from something super unstructured, like a PDF or a Word document. This seems like magic for those folks who haven't seen it before, but it is now looking to create you know, insight and systems that you can query from documents that are literally published for human consumption. And every time somebody spits out a PDF, you can pull it in automatically. Uh, you can pull it in automatically, but the gory details
details of making that work successfully will come later because there's some some nuance to it. Yeah. Uh, so we got to consider a range of problems. Yep. And this this comes down to understanding right what data do you have right you don't you don't just say we do this AI problem and we bet the business on because that's probably not a good idea but you say you know here are business processes that are central to our business if we did this five percent more we'd make twenty percent more revenue you know figure out what are the business processes that are impactful and lay them out on the table based on impact lay them out based on perceived risk lay them out based on you know availability of data whether internally or externally. Or you're going to have to develop, you know, from scratch, use some of those uh, generalized frameworks. The more resources you're going to have to apply. But it's it's a decision like any other decision in the enterprise to adopt technology. And even though it's just AI and it's a great big umbrella, you still have to be, you know, very very intentional about how you pursue it. Almost yeah. like the way EA is developed, you have to decide what's the right component. So some low hanging fruit. Well, we've got some examples in the next yeah. few slides. All right. So it goes down to picking the right type of AI based on your problem. And this is where we figure out what are our low-hanging fruits. So my, my, my usual guidance is, you know, if, if an AI system exists that can reasonably solve your problem, then you sh should probably use that existing implementation. So what are good, fun, and easy examples of this? Well, sentiment analysis is an easy one, right? That's doable everywhere. You can do it on-prem. You can do it through open source libraries. You can buy products and, and license APIs to do it. Visual recognition is another great one. Well, I mean, it's, it's really relevant today with Twitter, right? So you're getting a lot of feedback from customers from Twitter or from social media. You know, doing sentiment analysis on your own documents is probably pretty dull. <laughs> but doing sentiment analysis on how people think of, you know, and perceive your enterprise, well, that's in a whole different all of that data is coming down to you in real time, you can actually graph out your sentiment over a period of time. Oh, right. And with, with AI systems where they are today, even on the super specialized out-of-the-box stuff, they can even give you a finer level of granularity. They won't just say that he was really upset about something. They'll say he was really upset and he mentioned this AI session by two guys from IBM. Must have not been a very good session. Then you have insight. Let's not repeat that session. It's that level of insight that's really valuable because it's not enough to just know that someone hated your product or hated the experience. You want to know what they didn't like about it. And likely, you want to know that has that person have a pattern of criticizing things, right? Did the person who bombed on this session also bomb on literally every other session they talked about? If that's the case, then maybe you might not weight everything they say as much versus if someone else who's been loving Open Group for years had an open critique after being an avid supporter, that might be a data point that you might consider a little more closely. You know, uh, the world's leaders, uh, they speak on an on almost ongoing everyday basis. And you can take sentiment analysis from, you know, what they say and infer, you know, what might happen. And this is something that uh, governments are actually using AI for. So you can tell whether or not you're about to get into a, uh, a scrum with another company. Uh, our country, sorry, um, you know, because of the tone of the leader and how it escalates over a period of time. Subtleties that you, Michael, probably wouldn't understand. Well, there's a, there's another AI fun does. another fun example. One of our other colleagues at IBM, another uh, distinguished engineer and one of my first mentors at the company, uh, she she wrote an application that would do a tone check for all of her emails because she had gotten the feedback multiple times that she came off a bit critical. And so now she's got a system that will analyze the tone of her outgoing email so she can determine, is this appropriately toned for my intent? Yep. And again, that wasn't a very huge lift or a hard application to create. But she understood the need. She recognized that she wanted to align her tone to her intent and to her audience, and she was able to do that. You know, another low-hanging fruit is um, translating from one language to the next. And, uh, you know, I know that we do a lot of that here. But, you know, some of these systems have gotten so good at doing that that they can do it in real time and be, you know, very close to, you know, absolutely correct. So that's, that's something to consider. But we talked a little bit about, you know, some of the low-hanging fruit. What do you do if, you know, the low-hanging fruit isn't really where you want to go? Well, you know, you've got two choices here that you need to evaluate, right? The first choice is, is, is the choice where you say, okay, I know a bunch of these existing specialized AI capabilities. I know they're easy to use. Maybe I have experience using them on a prior project. Let me look at these different
different capabilities from a single vendor or across vendors and figure out, can I combine them in some way to create the new novel capability that I want? Is there a way for me to do some kind of analysis that says, hey, you know, I can create a data processing pipeline where I get a tweet, I run it through some analysis to do sentiment, and then maybe I run it through a separate analysis to do inference. And then I end up with a set of data and an inference engine that can tell me, given a topic, how do I think people will react? That inference engine on its own, a recommendation engine, is a relatively difficult thing. But if you combine some of the existing specialized AI, you can create it. IBM's Jeopardy Watson is an example of a recommendation system where you were asking very explicit questions and it took all this data into account and made a recommendation of this is the thing I think it is. There wasn't ever just one answer, there were multiple, but we always went with the best answer. At the same time, there's a possibility that nothing in the specialized AI world seems to do it or it's not sufficient. And in that case, you might use a custom AI implementation using some of the lower level frameworks. You can still pull in something like IBM Watson, Microsoft, or Google, or others, but you might have to go whole hog still on that base of a custom AI implementation. Yeah. So uh, we haven't said this yet, but a lot of folks think that somehow RPA is uh, AI. Is RPA AI? Well, I'd say it depends on who you ask. <laughs> I mean, in the end, right, RPA is about automating a process, and you have your inputs and outputs, but it doesn't really go much beyond that. But you might have RPA vendors who do some AI magic for you that maybe looks at data and makes an inference and says, well, I bet this should go in this business process. That might be AI, but at the core, RPA is, doesn't require AI to happen. Yeah, no, I'd say it's not. <laughs> Most vendors that are providing are just providing automation. And I'm not saying it's not interesting, because I've seen some really interesting RPA implementations that save a lot of money. But I don't really think of it as AI. So deep learning uh, systems, you know, that's pr those are pretty hefty duty. That's a that's a you know maybe a space military kind of aerospace application kind of uh, uh, opportunity. Maybe. Yeah. There might be other applications as well, right? But it really you know to get to that point, you have to have a problem where you really understand the different factors that you want to pick up on. Because again, when you think of any of these systems, just in your mind, picture creating a human being who has one job and teaching them how to look at the data and make some decision or recommendation. Again, our vote, you put a human between that system and the decision, but think of that as the system. So even in a deep learning system, you know, even with that approach, you still have to have data that's useful. You yeah. still have to know how to translate it to a business problem that you want to solve. Yeah. All right, well, um, I think we're, uh, you, we made it back to the questions, and then we're going to take We did. We've got a solid minute for questions. All right. Does somebody, does somebody have a question? Minute question. There we go. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, pretty much, uh, so many things are happening here. So just uh, my question here is very straight. Uh, when we are talking about the AI, the applications there, uh, one of the point is um, uh, the way is not mature yet. If I'm not wrong, it's still it's not mature yet because we are also transiting from human walk to the the IoT is coming down to the floor, and therefore no anything we are going to train it won't be applicable. Uh, that's why I know what I'm thinking uh, is my understanding. Uh, anything you are going to train the data, it won't be relevant uh, to the next uh, digital revolutions, right? Uh, how, how is going to be applied? Uh, that means uh, if you are going to make it a supervised and supervised uh, machine learning, or uh, those things is coming to the picture, AI is coming sun, comes under unsupervised machine learning, if I'm not wrong, and someone has to monitor it, what are the things is happening, and any uh, 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 anomaly detections, what we are detections, what we are going to observe it, we have to retrain it. Uh, what is your uh, view on that? That means AI is not pretty much robust as such now. So, so I, I I think that's part of the issue is that AI is about. Um, I don't ever. I think that that the training systems will get better, but I don't see that you cannot. You know, simply just let an AI off the <laughs> leash by itself. Um, it doesn't mean that it's immature. It just means that uh, it is what it is. It's a learning system. And uh, you're going to have to watch it from a bias point of view and a training point of view and an output point of view. What do you think, Michael? Yeah, I mean, these AI systems also
also provide a window into our own souls, right? It gives you as a business an opportunity to understand what might you be missing today. And where, where I say there's immaturity in my client engagements is the ability to accept that criticism. Or I've had systems that I've designed and, and led development of that provide an answer that the organization says is not correct. And you know, I've stood in front like a PhD making the case for the AI that this is very much the correct answer. But the business said, not the way we think. Yeah. And so we put the blinders on and the system now says the right answer based on their expectation. To me, that's the greatest immaturity is that many organizations that say they're data driven are only in s data driven in so far as they understand the data. As and they may not be ready. Goes. Right, as far as their enterprise culture goes. So drive, you want me to? All right. <clears throat> so now we've come to the meat. For those people fun. who like to see things that are real, right? Or, or, or something like that. Yeah, it's, it's very easy to talk about AI, and it's very fun as well. But this stuff becomes more meaningful when we take a look at some actual examples, understand how they're built, the types of AI systems that are being leveraged, and then actually show them in action. And this will illustrate you know, the general process of adapting AI to business use cases. This will showcase a couple of actual use cases in the open group with AI applied to them, and then we'll have a bit of a discussion around, you know, where the system is today, maybe what we could do if we wanted to move into production. Right. Other ideas. So, uh, our first example is an assistant, or um, the colloquial term is chatbot. Really hate that because it makes it sound easy and ch churlish, but in fact, it's not. What a chatbot or an assistant is is essentially uh, a conversation between you and an AI. And like a conversation between two humans, when I asked Michael, you know something about cybersecurity? He says, no. And that <laughs> means I need to find somebody else. Um, but when I do find somebody who knows something about cybersecurity, we're likely to have a conversation where I ask them a series of questions and you know they use their knowledge base around cybersecurity to provide me with answers. At the same time, a more motivated employee might say, I don't know anything about cybersecurity, but I can go find out for you because That's I know someone who does. Right. So if, if, if you have your cell phone and I don't and I ask you some question, you could actually type it in and and go find it, and then still give me the answer, which is a relevant analogy to, way, to the way that uh, an assistant or a chatbot works. So in that context, what does that mean? That means that I have to be talking to somebody who has a knowledge base, who has a corpus of information um, that has been trained around the subject matter that I'm interested in. And that means that you have to teach your assistant or chatbot, um, the subject matter in which you want to use it. And uh, the use case that's most likely um, one that's familiar is a support use case. So there's an awful lot of situations where uh, companies or organization staff will constantly field the exact same set of questions over and over and over again, and they really don't enjoy that very much. Um, <clears throat> so what you want to do is be able to provide a, uh, an experience where you feel like you're having a conversation. You want to create modality that uh, kind of syncopates with the human themselves. So it could be <clears throat> voice recognition that is being used, or it could, could just be um, natural language processing using text, which will be the example that we use today. But in reality, Michael has this set up so that you could actually, um, with TJBot, ask TJBot a question just, you know, uh, via the voice, and the microphone in TJBot will pick that up, and then we'll pass it on to the chatbot that he has integrated into it. So. Uh, in the case of the example we're going to use today, we're going to use the Open Group Professions uh, standard and the support for becoming certified as the case study. And what we want to do is create a chatbot or an assistant that answers questions uh, about uh, becoming certified or moving from one certification level to the next or resetting your password or something of this nature. And so what does that mean for our 
the process that we're going to go through to build that. Well, first off, um, we have to know something about what are the common questions that are asked, right? And so we went to Deborah and, and the, on the staff, and she came up with a document. Um, Michael and I, fortunately, had already been building a chatbot for something very similar called CARI. What does CARI stand for? Career Architect Certification Journey. It's not the best acronym, but I like it. <laughs> um, we didn't come up with, I don't think I came up with a very good uh, name of this particular chatbot. No, you didn't. Uh, I tried, but I, you know, it was like, uh, I think I... It's the hardest part of these systems, yeah, really. Right, yeah, naming. <laughs> I, I think I came up with something like uh, Toby or something like that. Anyway, um, so, so first off, you have to have some knowledge about uh, the subject. You want to know what are the questions that are going to be asked. Um, you certainly want to know what is the correct answer. You want to know the entities that are involved, right? So you want to know the, you know, the, uh, the, in, the data entities that are part of the subject matter in corpus. And you want to know the synonyms that are, might be used. So that is the alternative ways for asking the same question and getting the same expected answer. So I might say, I'd like to know something about certification or architect certification, but somebody else might ask, um, can you tell me about, or I would like to know about architect certification, or I have a question about architect certification. Or even better, something as simple as certify me. Yeah, certify me. Not even a please on that one. Right. So let's get into this a little bit. You've got, you've got the Word document if you want to show some of the yeah, examples. Yeah, no, I was, I'm doing exactly that. Excellent. I don't know if I can. All right. Ah, uh, you got it. Yeah. <laughs> it's backwards. All right. So here are some of the top questions that Deborah came up with. I'm I'm an interested in applying for Open CA certification and would like further information. And she even has a uh, a reference uh, answer for us and a set of links. So one of the things that I can do is that I can actually integrate this with an existing system and I can pass in from the environment information about who is using the system. Now I didn't do this in this minimal viable product, but it can start off with saying, hi, Andras, welcome to uh, Bob, or whatever our, the name of our, our certification or, uh, chatbot might be. Um, I, can I help you with information about the open profession. Um, and I can also, if you know anything about Bank of America, and you, you might be from the United States, they launched a, uh, an assistant called Care, uh, Erica. And Erica is an IBM uh, solution. And Erica actually, you know, you just press the button and you say, can you show me my balance, Erica? And Erica will come back with the information about your balance. And you say, I'd like to know the last three transactions about my card and it'll come back with that. And you can ask it all sorts of other reference questions and it'll come back with um, guidance on how to find that information. So here it is. The uh, you know, first question was, I'm interested in OpenCA. Uh, the other one is, I'm an OpenCA certified, but I can't find my name in the directory. Uh, how do I set a personal code? Um, I'm certified, but I haven't received my badge. That's a nice one. I'm uh, certified through my employer, but they left the company. How do I keep my certification? I want to recertify, so on and so forth. So actually, um, because of the work that we did with uh, Carrie, um, I had a little head start from the work that she provided to me. And there was actually much more that you really needed to know if you were going to make this a real conversational chatbot. So um, I've. Uh, I've augmented um, what she gave me um, with uh, the information that we already knew. So this is the Awas uh, Watson Assistant uh, Canvas. I'm going to go ahead and open my profession assistant uh, space, workspace. And immediately you have, you recognize that we have uh, a few um, elements here. One of them is intents, the other is uh, entities, and then you have dialogue and content dialogue. 
uh, we won't be going into content dialog, but let's say that um, you know again you want to get a jump start and you're in a particular space. Uh, what we come up with is uh, a, a, you know taxonomy for you to use kind of out of the jar. So let's look at our intents. We're in the intent space. Um, so what are some of the intents that somebody might have when interacting with an assistant around certification? Well, well, let me and let me let me paint it a different way for those who are uh, tuned to some of the other machine learning AI language. Think of these. Uh, think of this as a supervised learning system, and think of these as your sentence level classifications. How many of these do we want? Well, the question, as Andros has posed, really comes down to what do we want to recognize when a user is interacting with us, talking about uh, the the open professions. Well, one question might be is who who is the heck is the open group itself? And um, so I've created an intent called the open group. I can add a description here, to, which I didn't do at, at that time. Like, you know, I would like to know if I can see. And I'm typing on Michael's machine, which is driving me crazy. Um, so anyway, uh, what are some of the intents here? Well, let's look at this one. Um, I need to know more about open group certification. Uh, how do I get TOEG certification? Uh, I want to get open group certified. You know, all of these things are good examples. I don't think I have any uh, synonyms here. But one thing I'll call out for this particular intent is you'll notice the questions are actually rather broad. All of them are asking questions about the open group, but if you have a, have a savvy eye, you could jump back to that intent just for a second, Andros. I'm going to go to the one that I That one, on. yes. Okay. So this one is a lot tighter around more simple what is questions. The other open group intent, if you notice, is sort of a general catch-all. This one is much more nuanced around telling No, the, the other one was actually more about certification. So when you ask somebody about the open group, it was intended to um, trigger a conversation around, you know, just what is the open group itself. Uh, the other one was more about, well, tell me about open group profession certification and how are all the different ways that I can ask that question, right? Um, so I could use a synonym um, for a particular word, like tell me about or I'd like to ask you. Those are all essentially equivalent phrases. So it, what you try to do is build a corpus that leads you to the same response, or leads you to a particular response. Um, so let's see here. Let's do another one. Um, certification pay. Like, do I get uh, a raise if I get certified? Will certification get me paid more? Will I get paid more? Will I get paid more by getting certified? All of those questions are questions that you might have people ask, and we have had them ask them because we're right. tracking this information. Right. This um, may or may not be the number one intent. It may or may not be the number no, one. No, no, it, it might not be. <laughs> Here are some of the entities that you have. Uh, for example, architect discipline. In the profession certification, there are three different disciplines right now. Uh, one of them is business. Uh, you get certified as a business architect. The other one is a enterprise architect. And the uh, last one is a solution architect or an IT architect. So IT architect has uh, th uh, three different synonyms. IT architect, well, actually four, ITA, uh, architect, and solution architect. And basically, all of those boil down to IT architect. Now, if you're following along from the general AI machine learning handbook, this uh, under entities you could think of as phrase level classification. So you'll have one classification for the entire sentence to say, here's what I think they're asking about. And then you'll have uh, phrase level classifications that say, in, in the context of that, of that whole sentence in that class, 
here are the subclasses that we're applying, right? He's asking what is the open group, and he's also asking about um, solution architect. That's context that might drive the kind of response we give. So if I ask about the open group, and I'm, this is the dialogue, and the dialogue has a set of nodes, and those nodes re reflect di different intents and entities and states. So I can establish states by setting a parameter, like for example, if I, you have previously uh, set up, uh, if you previously asked me about becoming architect certified, I can save that state, and I, I know that context in a variable now. Um, or I could actually just go back and look and see if the last thing you said about an architect you know, was either about getting certified as a, a business architect or as an IT architect, as an example. And I can create state and, I, and flow within the dialogue. So I can mirror what your expected uh, experience should be. So for example, um, in this particular uh, dialogue, you come in, you get a welcome statement, you're expected to probably ask about what type of architect or, or specialty that you're going to get certified in, and then you drop down into the intents that are specific to those particular types. And they, in turn, provide you with information about where to find more context around those areas. So um, here I've got, for example, if we look at this, uh, generalized questions. Generalized questions uh, are pertinent to both soon all three certification, open profession certification programs. So there are general questions about certification within the open group under the open profession certification themselves. So uh, questions about accredited uh, program certification, converged certification, certification pay, where I can find you know, help with respect to a claim. I need to get an extension on my certification. Um, where do I find the open CA FAQ? Um, and then I, I would also add one here for open SIT. Um, I need a mentor. I need support. In other words, I got to talk to somebody. Um, how do I get, a, you know, a a a question to a an, a, an, a, a human being, uh, so on and so forth. You want to make sure that that last piece about getting to support is kind of the last op option um, when using a chatbot because you're really trying to solve their problem before it gets to be uh, a human. Right, um, and, and many of these capabilities, like at least the capability IBM has, has analytics on the back end, which is pretty important because you know the questions that you expect that are reported, but when, when you end up with an AI system that is as easy as going to a URL, you don't know what people are asking. And the example Andros provided about the linkage between certification and pay was a question that people didn't realize we were getting asked as often as we were getting asked. So early on, we have a set of ideas that represent what we think people are going to ask and answers that we think address that. But this system is a stake in the ground. And it's almost like a, a customer sentiment station that can hear questions and later on give you answers and insight around what do people really ask about. Yeah. Maybe when you tell people that there's not a direct linkage between certification and pay, they get really upset. You know, and that might inform the way you create your messaging and perhaps the way you address some of your policies. So uh, in the case of asking you know, about the open group, like who the heck is the open group? Or just open group, if I were just We've to say. We've got nine minutes left on this section, so okay. we can buzz faster and sh shorten All the last right. piece. Um, what, what this does is says, hey, I recognize that this is a question about uh, the open group or the entity, the open group. And here is the text that I'm providing back, and a URL, and the image of the open group. And, and in here, I've got uh, different additional answers that I can provide. Ask me about the open group, open CA, open SIT. Ask me about uh, open profession certifications. And, and you can do that random or sequentially. So this is the back end that gets trained um, on this. 
let's let's pretend like I need to add uh, and here I want to recertify what do I need to do so the question is really uh, I want to recertify so I'm just going to copy that and you can think of that as your data curation step you'll see all the answers all the questions you get asked but ultimately you want to try to refine that into a signal that is obvious to the system, or more obvious, let's say. And I'm going to add an intent. And I'm going to call this ask
process here is actually training the ai so that you get the right answer at the right time and it's not only training it when you're developing it but training it as people are using it and we'll show you how that works in a second So this highlights some of the complexity that exists because in this system you have on one hand a set of classifications at the sentence level, another a set of classifications at the phrase level. These are all distinct data sets that you train in real time as you develop the system. Powered by both of those sets, phrase level and sentence level classes, you have this ultimate, the brain and the logic of chatbot. And you know these systems as you're seeing all have separate components that might evolve separately. The classification and the data behind those classes may change over time. The logic that he's showcasing here may change over time based on the business process. So even for this simple example of a, an assistant, as we said, chatbot was churlish, there's still some complexity. I mean, you have expertise here of people who know the questions that are being asked, but it takes some effort to characterize, you know, what are people gonna ask? How do we wanna answer them? And then how do we connect those two to some experience that is meaningful? So we collect data that's relevant, and we give them answers to the questions that we think will resolve their, uh, resolve their concern. Yeah. So this is uh, one of the modalities. This is just an embedded web page. just 
say start over and I'll start me from the top. Um, I want to, uh, to get open group certified. And it said, I don't know what the heck you're talking about. You got to ask me about uh, architect. So I'm just going to say open CA. And now it tells me about uh, open CA. And uh, uh, I would like to get uh, certified as an open CA IT architect. And it provides me with more information about how to get to that. There we go. And it tells me that I can get in a self-assessment, use the self-assessment tool. And, um, and where to get information about the fee. So that goes to show you that you can embed this in different types of clients. Um, and I'm going to have to actually figure out why that I retrained the model to, uh, to break. But hey, that was a good exercise. It at least showed you that you had to be careful about uh, how you actually program these things. But um, so but prior to breaking the model, I was actually uh, getting all of the right answers about where to find information about OpenCA, OpenSITS. Uh, I could go down to the stream. Uh, I could ask how to get certified uh, you know, as an enterprise architect, which seems to be working right now. Well, and what's noteworthy and meaningful about showing something like an integration with a chat application like Slack is Slack has a web experience, a desktop experience, but also a phone experience. So by having this AI system that we've now trained on this open CA, these open professions, and we can now see it experienced on different modalities. And most AI systems are likely going to have different manifestations across you know, web, thin client, thick clients, and even here mobile. And courtesy of a mobile device, I have you know, my mobile device providers in, uh, in automatic speech to text if I wanted to yell at this thing and get an answer back. So these are some of the ways that you take these basic AI capabilities and plug them into what is the existing ecosystem and end up with very rich user experiences where you're not responsible for the entire implementation. So it actually is uh, finding the right answers now. Um, so I'm, I'm asking a bunch of questions about you know where do I find my badge? I want my badge. Where do I uh, go to get badges that's in a claim um, so I've embedded here images uh, from the open group about badges um, you can do all sorts of fancy things like that you can pass context in about who is logged in for example you go into the open group uh, website you log in you can pass in the user information you could theoretically integrate it in with uh, well not theoretically you could integrate it in with the uh, uh, the certification system and have it spit out very specific information about the uh, the user that is using the the uh, chatbot, just like you would with Erica and, and the bank. Certainly. Um, so that's that that is uh, you know all I have on the uh, the chatbot itself. Um, the artificial intelligence model that is using is using uh, natural language transla translation. Uh, um, understanding uh, and um, it's building a context model for the corpus that we've created around the certification entities and the questions and intents that we had set up. So, so we've got Michael? a picture we can show before we jump off this. I know we spent quite a bit of time, but I think it's worth being in a bunch of architects. So this is effectively what um, a high level architecture of what you've just seen, right? You have some front user experience, could be web based, could be Slack based, could be a robot, and they have some question, some statement. We classify it, we enrich it, so we understand somewhat of what they're asking, somewhat of, of you know, given the context of what they're asking, about what are they asking, and then we come up with some answer based on a context of sentence level and phrase level classification. And ultimately, we give an answer, and hopefully they like it. If not, they yell at us, and we figure out how to do it better next time. This high-level architecture is something that can be extended and interpreted different ways for different contexts. In the case of OpenCA, we saw um, 
a system built to be a bit of a customer service system, right? The purpose of this was to make people, uh, to give them ways to understand how do I get information about these open professions and how do I do it without having to bother him because he doesn't read, you know, hundreds, thousands of emails, right? You don't need hundreds and thousands more. But if you have a system that can understand what, is these, what do these people really need, then it can provide that to them in real time. So as you see this system in front of you, you can imagine in enterprises, right, other chatbot use cases that are also common, things like support help desks for IT, as well as other support help desks for core enterprise functions, both internally and externally. Right. And as Andros mentioned, a great thing about many of these systems is you can integrate them with some third-party system, you know, whether it's an existing enterprise SSO or some customer, um, some customer experience, so you know before they even say hello, exactly who you're talking to. And that can inform some of our dialogue as far as the answer we provide. For instance, the answer you give someone like him may be different when you ask about certification versus someone like me who's not yet but soon to be certified. So now looking at another system, which is similar but with a different context. Um, we're going to look at another question and answer system but in the context of TOGAF 9.2. Now TOGAF 9.2, for folks who are aware of the open group, it has a great open group standard. It describes different ways that we can create and do enterprise architecture. There's a lot of great expertise, and many folks may even get a certification in TOGAF to show that expertise. One common um, occurrence, though, is that folks who are new to TOGAF, even if they're certified, may have some difficulty in understanding how do I do a thing with TOGAF. I mean, they may be certified, they may have good expertise and good mentors, but they may just not understand how to translate a real world issue into something like TOGAF. Or they might know something about TOGAF and they want to learn more about that something. So the approach we've taken here is to take a similar thing like we showed with a chatbot, but now oriented to TOGAF. Now in the case of TOGAF, we have a document that's very knowledge heavy. So what we did is run it through a data pipeline, similar to what we showed earlier, and create an application which, latency permitting, we can use to run queries against. This application serves to provide some kind of insight into TOGAF. Now keep in mind, our core user here includes people who are experts at TOGAF and may likely know answers to people who have never heard of TOGAF before. And they don't really know where to start, but they have some ideas, they have some words that they know that carry some meaning. So the way one would interact with this system is you take whatever question you have about TOGAF. And you know TOGAF pretty well, Andros. What's a good question? Um, let's see, what are the stages in the ADM, architecture development method? Let's be easy. Let's make it a long version. Architecture development method. And let's see how latency treats us today. <coughs> so what's happening as we're sending this question, right? This is question is being sent in this implementation as an unstructured query. So this sentence is being diced up. It's being tokenized. They're using traditional search technologies, but they're also using a bit of AI-empowered search. Each of these documents relating to TOGAF have been, you know, processed by AI, digested into pieces of meaning, segmentation is what we call that, and it's been presented at, within an AI-empowered search index. So when you do a search and you ask this question, it goes beyond just the simple text search. Behind the scenes, we could implement more customized training that maybe when we see architectural development method, we also look for instances of ADM. We may also do the reverse kind of inference that if you see ADM, we might extend that to be architecture development method. Whatever the case, we do a search and we get back a set of, a set of candidate responses. Now these responses are, again, chunks pulled from the TOGAF standard itself. Um, in this particular system we've developed, they're just provided to us with some metadata and a link to see the extension of that section. We don't make any additional inference or assumption from there because this system is really meant to be a basic example implementation. So we see our, our, our top item here with a score of 0 0.5. That's this system sense that I think this is relevant to you. This system under the covers has not been finely tuned to know exactly what we think is relevant. We've just loaded documents and worked with it in that state to showcase just where AI algorithms can be without much training. And so the first section we have is called building blocks. And this is a section likely, if I, if I jump out here real quick, from the TOGAF standard itself. 
And if we open it up, we can see the actual text from this section and the, the parts of our search query that were found. Now, in this case, we're doing a, a fairly, rudimentary, uh, fairly rudimentary search. So the responses we're getting back include the tokenization of each individual word highlighted here. There's also a possibility for us to take this kind of query and, again, break it up into um, a search just looking for passages. But we ask the AI system under the covers to go a step further and not return us the whole answer, the whole section, but instead to return us what it thinks are the most relevant sections within that document. And so here within this section, we see some description about the TOGAF ADM. We see some description of the different building blocks within TOGAF ADM, as well as general characteristics of those building blocks. We can, uh, be because we had to break it up, we, uh, there are 109 documents that, uh, or segments of TOGAF that uh, match um, with uh, 93 positive sentiments, six neutral, and 10 negative. I would assume 10, 10 negative are like anti-patterns or something like that, you know, because this is a methodology. But uh, for, for whatever reason, somebody wrote those 10 uh, sections in a negative tone. Uh, that's, that's exactly correct. And what's important to distinguish here is this system in the current basic implementation, again, is not doing a very complex processing of the question. So we've, not, we've intentionally done that to showcase what systems can do sort of w without much tweaking. What, what, what one can do as one evolves a system like this is progress it by adding more advanced analysis of the search phrase. And I'd like to showcase that architecture here. So this represents a possible extension of what we've just shown, where instead of passing the question directly to your search index that has AI behind it, you do several levels of pre-processing of your question. This pre-processing can be similar, can be thought of in a similar fashion as to what you saw with the um, professions chatbot. We're going to try to classify the question to figure out what manner of question is it, and we're going to try to do phrase level um, classification to say, you know, he's asking about a relationship and he mentions TOGAF and he mentions ADM. There's an implied relationship between those two concepts that we think is meaningful. So to showcase that at a, at a very high level, we, I've actually got another very simple system here. And this very basic system just accepts a phrase and attempts to digest it using a very shallow set of training data that we've provided. So in this case, um, the training data here is around um, asking some of the similar TOGAF questions. So um, this system is trained on our custom you know, sentence level classifiers, um, and, but it also has um, phrase level classification that's untrained. So this is stuff pulled from things like Wikipedia. So if we send this question out, what we get back is a classification of our question. Again, this is based on the training data in that spreadsheet. It's very shallow. Uh, we trained it that based on questions like this, we think you're asking about inputs. We think you're asking about you know, at what point in this ADM process do your business continuum requirements serve as an input. At the same time, in our untrained model that does you know, Wikipedia style analysis of phrases, it picked up ADM as an organization. Now we know that's not right, we know that has different meaning. But this general purpose model that we're showcasing perceives ADM as the acronym representing a company. Because in most other contexts, you know, a, an acronym like IBM, like TOG for the open group, does represent an enterprise or an organization. But so if we were to take our search system on top of TOGAF and evolve it further, we would do an approach like this to try to understand at a deeper level the semantic meaning of what, it, what is a person asking about, combined with about what are they asking, and use that to do a much more targeted query. So another system that we'd like to at least bring to mention as another possible example of, of something with AI aligned towards you know, some of the business of standards, though unfortunately we don't have an easy way to demo it, is a conference call transcription system. Within the work of standards development, there's a lot of great dialogue. You've heard some of it here in the conference today, people presenting, people sharing ideas. Right now, there are folks um, in member meetings having discussions about problems and having um, spirited uh, dialogue about it's this way, no, it's that way, no, it's a service, no, it's not a service, et cetera. 
An important part of generating standards from that kind of activity is taking notes, taking minutes, on recording what people are saying, and distilling that into a sense of significance, where you say, so-and-so from IBM said this, and there's the implication of it. So-and-so from another company said that. Here's the implication or the action inferred from that. So in a current process, these minutes are generated using, uh, using an artisanal process. They're handmade. And there's value in that because there's a lot of context required for many of these minutes to be meaningful. You have to know what the group is doing to understand what's the significance of what someone just said. So another way this could be empowered by AI would be the use of AI for audio transcription. So in the case of a system that you know it exists on my laptop but not something fun to demo, um, you can play audio to the system and the system can transcribe the text of what people are saying and then send it back as text associated with that meeting. This represents a fairly low-hanging fruit when it comes to AI application. Where things get interesting and uh, potentially a little scary is what you do with that data. Because in that data set, you now have a lot of insight coming back around who said what, what is this forum talking about. In this forum's meeting yesterday, did they talk about that forum? And those kinds of insights are valuable and useful. Though for our initial example here, we looked at it more from a cost-saving perspective of figuring out how to help automate the process of minutes. So really, for many of these systems, it comes down to understanding the question that you're being asked. Um, as we saw, this is not a trivial thing, but it can be addressed if you're very intentional and narrow about how you want to scope your, your efforts. In the case of the chatbots, you have the brilliance of your chatbot engineers, of your business process owners, folks who know the domain well, like Andros and some of the staff at the Open Group. In the case of something more open-ended, like TOGAF, you have a sea of insurmountable questions, the ones you know people are going to ask and the ones you don't know. And you can attempt to use AI to create intelligence around that. And you can also attempt to use a little bit of staff expertise to train the system to be able to you know, decompose those questions into some kind of meaningful query. But ultimately, you go from that question, from that unstructured data, into some kind of structure that enables deeper insights, that enables things like entity resolution, that enables us to understand that when someone asks a question to our TOGAF system, they're specifically talking about a particular concept within TOGAF that we can have the system meaningfully assert is part of this section. So at this point, we've, we've sort of concluded the live demo section, session, and we've done it probably uh, 21 minutes over, so we've got about nine minutes. I mean, one of the things that I uh, uh, didn't show you was that um, we can actually get information about how the chatbot is being used. And here we have analytics that show the conversation, um, and the amount of conversation usage and the top intents and the top e entities that were utilized. And this gives us kind of an idea of, of whether or not we're getting the right information about um, that particular intent. Like, you know, we can select the open group and, and see, you know, what the, uh, what the context was there. see that there were a total of uh, 12 conversations about the open group and that uh, uh, the conversation over the last few days you know dipped and then increased uh, in context so we can also take the log and look at uh, the types of questions that are being asked and determine whether we're getting any errors or not and then we can train the chatbot based on what you know that that particular data shows and, and you'll see some of this process might remind you of some of the work you do in software development you deploy a system you have it in a point where you think it works and then you just have to continually analyze it see how it's working modify it update it as you need to and this is where we see you know a lot of importance on treating that as a separate formal process and some of the guidance we've given so far and some of what we see with many clients today. Yep. So one of the things that you would do uh, is probably pretty this up, put it on a, another interface, maybe even change the modality so that you could use just natural language recognition. And one of the other things that we can do without any kind of effort whatsoever is run it through a translator and go back and forth between English and another language. And 
uh, and talk to somebody who is a non-native English speaker so they can say, I'd like to talk to you in Japanese or something of that nature uh, without any effort whatsoever. And I don't have to spend any money on translation. Now that approach is one approach to localization. Mm -hmm. IBM has done both. In some of our larger enterprise systems, we try to uh, compare answers in the translated language to answers in the native language itself. But based on the complexity of your system, the, the, the sort of translation upon question received will likely work for many use cases. And there are some parts of at least IBM where we do use that to take advantage of providing you know, multilingual experiences without having to invest in deep uh, translator um, expertise for you know, a variety of translation tasks. Or you could just do the translation and see if it's right and tweak it, right? Yeah. So you don't have to spend a lot of time with it. And th that's the other thing. So, and you could uh, use the information that comes out of this as analytics to tell you about what uh, the sentiment of, uh, you know, working with the open profession uh, chatbot is, you know? Certainly, and, and though, you know, for many of these AI projects, you initially build them with the intent of addressing a business problem, like automating the creation of minutes or saving the staff from having to respond to a bunch of important questions that all have the same answers. But as Andros mentioned, over time, you'll create data that allows your enterprise to, to do the next step. Then maybe you look at all the questions you're getting and determine that, hey, a lot of people need guidance on one particular part of OpenCA. Perhaps we should change or add additional guidance to that section, right? Perhaps we should evolve our offering and the documentation for that offering. Similarly to the TOGAF example, if we find a lot of people are asking questions about something we don't really address in TOGAF, maybe that now informs us that that's a new area of extension. And this is you know, an example of how organizations truly become data driven, is that you have systems that feed on your data, thrive on your data, and generate more data in turn that you can use to evaluate you know, the next best step for better business outcomes. All right, where do we go from here? Well, we've got some lessons learned to share in the last four to five minutes. And I'm sure we can jump through those rel relatively quickly. Oh, bias, my favorite. And, and brand identity. Um, so bias. Uh, my favorite example of bias recently was a situation where a company was actually uh, using AI to find the best candidates, which, by the way, we do actually do in IBM. We score your skills, and we actually are trying to rate employees based on AI assessments. And those assessments actually use things like information about the skills that you attain through acclaim, uh, the classes you've taken in within the formal training you've taken, uh, information about your social eminence, uh, how many assets you've contributed, stuff like that. Don't forget your certification. And your certification, <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, recently a company actually uh, was using a model like this and uh, they found that it was uh, selecting against certain universities and uh, potentially against women. Yep. And, um, and, you know, when Michael and I really dug into their model, uh, the AI was doing what it intended to do, find the best candidates. Um, but it was using some data that it, it got from a few sources that was leading it down the wrong path to, right. from training. But in reality, do they really need to have gender in there at all? Right, and that's, you know, that's the question. I mean, this example, right, this organization looking for the next big tech talent, and it just so happened in their existing data set of the people they had hired, many of them were men. And the AI system, which, you know, they didn't have hands on everything, kind of reasoned, well, what do these top performers have in common? Well, men. one of the things happens gender. to be that they're men. So what ended up happening when people were submitting is it would look and recognize mention of gender and score that as a not negative thing in the case of women, but rather just a positive thing in the case of men, because the system just blindly reasoned. There are ways to handle this, and um, I kind of had a laugh when I learned about it, because they're relatively well known. There are ways to hide the features that you don't want the system to learn from. So the system doesn't see male or female, it just sees strong technology background, maybe leadership, maybe you know, they, maybe they're, they're in the arts as well, right? Gotta have your balance. But when you give it data that's not curated or shaped properly, the system will pick up on weird things. I mean, I was a little sad to find out that 
the system didn't reason that people with dogs end up being better employees. Yeah. In, in my sample size of one, that's the trend I see. But in reality, too, you might want some bias in the system. Like Certainly. You might want to have more minorities because you don't have enough minorities. And even though they aren't really, you know, kind of bubbling up to the top of the performers list, you want to promote them or score them higher to assess them sooner in the cycle. Um, so in some cases, um, you, you actually culturally want bias um, put into the system. So, you know, it's a little tricky dribble, right? Yeah. I mean, in the case of the tech company, again, they might notice that their best performers have formal tech backgrounds. That just might be unarguable. And I know some people say, hire the bachelors in history, and not to say they're bad programmers. But let's say their data today says all of their strong folks have computer science undergrads and maybe masters as well. But you want more diversity because you say, we need people who don't come from strict tech backgrounds but learn tech later. You might have the system say, if you're a non-tech background, like Andros was mentioning, let's give you some extra points. Let's not exclude you immediately. Or let's score you in a separate pool with separate parameters, that being one of them. Yeah, that's one way of doing it. So you look for top performers, but maybe they don't necessarily have a uh, you know, tech background or the same tech background, but they're trainable. <laughs> just like the system. Yeah. Okay. So we're so we're formally on the hour, but I think we can jet yeah. through what we've got. So so um, you know this is uh, bias comes in different forms, um, and um, you know some of the challenges that you face with deployment of these things into the uh, enterprise, you know that that kind of boils down to trust and transparency, is around the difficulty in. Integrating it into the business applications themselves, uh, managing the uh, you know internal policies, the resistance to AI, um, and uh, lack of uh, of DevOps or those the, those skills that we talked about earlier that aren't necessarily readily available. You're going to have to train them, um, and um, maybe not even understanding the analytics of the data itself, right? Certainly. So, you know, there's uh, three different or four different um, particular roles here that we really have to, you know, focus on. We talked a little bit about this before, but there's, you know, building, uh, you know, the, the solution, so the data scientist's role, the running of the solution, the creating the solution, which is part of the software engineer's uh, responsibility, and this whole idea of of AI management uh, and um, business user uh, coming together. And, and those folks have a lot of responsibility and trust and integrity to make sure the model's working the right way. Um, so we did come up with a project that uh, we call OpenScale that we're inviting other companies that were open sourcing. And it's, uh, it's really kind of scrubbing, uh, intended to scrub your model to make sure that you're not putting an unintended bias into it. Things like adding gender or, or ethnicity or biasing against a certain school, let's say that uh, you know, you're, you, all of a sudden your AI model starts picking West Coast schools versus East Coast schools. If it doesn't know anything about them, then possibly um, it can't bias uh, selection from, you know, uh, bias uh, folks who go to the University of Virginia versus UCAL, UCAL Berkeley or something like that, right? Um, so OpenScale is intended to, you know, actually look at, at payload logging uh, from an integrity point of view, um, making sure that there is a, a, a visibility into how the model's performing operationally, um, be able to uh, more fully explain the model um, define some tests to defer determine fairness, so it generates data for you to actually run through the model, um, and then creates that model ops piece that we've been talking about. Um, and this is uh, really important because um, bias has actually become an inhibitor to use AI because people had you know looked at the unintentional um, you know use of, uh, of of gender that was included in the model previously. So um, how does AI impact your brand, Michael? Well, you know, as we saw with a couple of interactions we had with the sample systems we showcased, 
you have, whenever you interact with an IT system representing an organization or providing expertise attributed to an organization, it in essence becomes a representative of that organization. This is why when I work with any customers to build any AI systems that are externally facing, I always have uh, someone from marketing in the room, and I always have someone who represents the <coughs> core business transaction or interaction. Because these AI systems ultimately define someone's experience. Like if someone interacted with our chatbot and managed to confuse it, they'd say, man, this group is crud, you know, this certification's no good. And we all know that's not true, but the experience they had would give them that sense. They would walk away with that same idea if they interacted with someone with the open group who was just as rude. Because it's a frustrating experience. Now, if I, if I get questions, I'll send them to Michelle because I know she's nice, so they'll like the open group. But this is a key thing you have to understand. All of these brand touch points becoming automated still has huge implications. This is why we're big on human in the loop for most things, because this human experience that AI creates, again, is going to define that market, that brand identity you have in the market. Yeah. So there's a few approaches here. There's five, to be honest with you, and uh, obviously. And uh, we've showed two of them. Um, you know, the customer service interaction. Uh, with uh, chatbot and uh, enhancing the work of the knowledge worker, getting insight into the structure of uh, TOGAF through uh, the use of uh, IBM uh, Watson Discovery. Um, so, uh, but there is also managing complexity and risk. So we integrate uh, AI into things like Watson Cybersecurity. Um, so taking massive amounts of data that's coming out of the enterprise on how your security is functioning is, is certainly a good model. Um, using it to find the best uh, talent. So we do actually use that in our uh, talent systems uh, within IBM. And to empower developers uh, to actually create AI-based uh, applications themselves, right? Yep. I mean, in our case, we showed a few example applications, but in reality, you know, you would build up the underlying AI systems, and then that's a thing you can integrate with for other experiences. You could take that chat bot and have it a phone line that one calls in, for example, instead of just a web-based experience. So, I mean, here's, you know, just some other examples of some of the ways one can get started and, and work. But again, it, it really follows pretty much everything we've been describing, the way you can sort of improve some of these business processes, target what's critical to your enterprise, and figure out, do I have data around this? And can I apply just enough AI to get started, preferably AI someone else built, where then I can just focus on deriving value from that interaction? Here's now, a subject you really like. Oh, well, when it comes down to these systems, at the end of the day, the architecture still matters. I mean, in our example of showcasing some of these few sample applications, right? We edited a model on the fly, and things got crazy and hairy very quickly. That's all realities, right? These systems have an inherent complexity. And maintaining them and making them successful still requires architecture. The architecture from the application perspective, architecture from the data perspective, from the model perspective. In the enterprise systems that, that we've built doing even chat stuff, you've got multiple environments, you've got some kind of, you actually have a change review board, a change management board. I know we think it's an ugly word, but you know those processes still serve value. And, and architecture is a core part of that. Yeah, that's certainly true. And um, we've tended to throw architecture out with the, you know, the baby with the bathwater kind of analogy. Uh, we went uh, we went to agile. We went iterative. We created this idea of uh, minimal viable pro uh, product, but the product is not really viable, and it's sometimes not even minimal. But all the data is generating <laughs> is building up technical debt if it's not the right solution. So you definitely have to think in terms of the illities because right now ag agile and design thinking is all about outside in and it thinks of it in terms of the, how the user wants to interact with the system. That's great but as we know you know from the open group a lot of the success of your system is all of the illities, the 40 different illities, the non-functional requirements that are necessary to build a system that's maintainable. And uh, you have to begin to think about the architecture from the inside of the system out instead of the, uh, the end user perspective, which is mostly what we're doing these days. And I think that's it. Yeah. Wow, we made it to the end. <laughs> Any last minute questions before we let you escape? It is five minutes.
actually retrains the AI network to somehow, you know, befuddle badges and bridges, then I'm probably going to have to fall back to a uh, past corpus. Yeah, I mean, it comes down to data curation, right? This is why Microsoft Tay suffered such an untimely fate. Um, if, if you let just anyone, you know, adjust the model, you're, you're, you're going to have a bad time. And this is where I brought back the comment of DevOps. You want to be able to move these things quickly. In the case of our internal version of the nameless chatbot we showed, we've got our IBM's global career team who works with um, IBM's technical career path. And once a week, they look at the data. Once every two weeks, they propose changes to each other. And once every month or so, they actually make these changes. Sometimes they make them on the fly. But you know, we sort of empower them using DevOps methodology to make a mistake. And if something goes bad, they have a button I put that they push, and you run your DevOps pipeline, and you take the old stuff and you know throw it away, and put back in the put back in the, the put in the new stuff, or vice versa, right? I mean, it goes back to that same fail fast, fail forward methodology. In our case, you saw right.